What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to the Help More, Sell More podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Burlingame, here with my co-host, Joe Marcou. Joe, it's been a long holiday season. How are you feeling, man? You hanging in there? You know what? I feel fantastic. And whether I get ended up having COVID or not, because we ended up having a test. This is crazy, guys. I ended up yeah. having a COVID test that, that showed positive. Two days later, I did another test at home, and then it showed negative. And I, I feel great now. If you'd asked me yeah. five days ago, I honestly felt like death. So I don't know. Was it a cold? Was it a flu? Either way, yeah. Uh, onward and upward. Into 2022 we go. <laughs> no, that was your last hurrah. That's it. Of 2021. That was 2021, like literally hitting you with the door on the ass on the way out. That that's hey, exactly okay. what just happened. <laughs> onward and upward, baby. Exactly. Yep. All right. So speaking of 2021, let's talk about marathons, my friends. <laughs> Today, the topic is episode 16, handling objections. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Sometimes yeah. we really wish 2020, 2021 were sprints instead, and they were just done faster. But the way this applies to selling is that when you get into a sale, when you hear that first objection, that actually signifies the selling process beginning, and you should be ready for the long haul. This is a marathon. This is a this is, you know, objection after objection. This is constantly working towards that sale. Sometimes sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it feels like a sprint. Sometimes people just lay down and say, here you go. Here's my money. Let's do this thing. But I'd argue more times than not, you're going to handle at least one objection. And what we're going to talk about today is like, what if you had to handle three or four or five and maybe Joe and I will share some records that we've handled in order to no get kidding. an actual sale. So this should be fun. Just so you guys know, we mention it every episode. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast and you appreciate what you're hearing, if you're putting this to action, if you're seeing results from this, you know, again, be sure to drop us a five star review. This helps us out a ton with searchability on the podcast. And we're here to help more people like that's what we want to do. So if you can spread the love, spread the wealth and share these episodes around. We appreciate it very much. You can also join our Help More, Sell More free Facebook group and uh, just answer a few questions to get into there. We just wanna make sure you're a real person and that you own a business or you're a salesperson, and then you can get in there. We're gonna start selling more or sharing more content in there to help you sell on selling content. And giving more uh, stuff away. More yeah, we're giving it away. Stuff. And uh, we'll probably do some lives in there. So there's some cool stuff coming down the line for that. So be sure to hop into that as soon as you can. Now, again, the big question for today, Joe, is are you giving up on the sale after just one to two objections? Is it just is it the fire's too hot? You're jumping out, man. Like what? What do you the think? What do you see? I like, I like that. Yeah. What do, what do you see when you talk to salespeople? Like, are you seeing this recognizing? It? I'm sure you've seen it in businesses in the past. Yeah, yeah. The, for those who are well trained, they understand the fact that I've got to be asking more questions. I've got to be mm -hmm. able to understand what is it that is holding someone back. And you've heard me say this before. And, and for those of you who've been listening to this podcast, you know that we say this often. People are going to give you an objection because they're afraid to make the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. They're also afraid to the commitment when they make the right one. Yeah. So either way, people are going to be, they're bathing in the fear. And are you, as a helpful salesperson, are you willing to do the same? Are you ready to, you know, take the heat? Because the fact of the matter is, as Jeff mentioned, when, when somebody provides you an objection, they're not necessarily saying no to you. They mm -hmm. may be, by the way, and that's a whole other episode. Um, the, the, what they're saying no to at that moment, generally speaking, is they're saying no to the value proposition. They don't see the value. Yeah. They don't see the purpose and or they're afraid to make the wrong decision. And so as, as important as the discovery process is, if you don't know how to handle objections, this is what happens for most salespeople. Yep. Most salespeople will tell me, Joe, I hate sales. I don't want to be a pushy salesperson because they feel <laughs> that whenever they handle an objection correctly, and most people don't know how to handle an objection correctly, by the way, when, when they handle an objection, they feel all of a sudden it's like, well, if, that, if I can handle the one, then I can, it's one and done. And it's not yeah. how it works. It's, you know, the, the, the idea behind it, if we're using the marathon analogy, it's similar to the marathon, I also known as maybe a steeplechase or a hurdle analogy, you're, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a marathon with hurdles involved. 
The yep. hurdle is the objection. And you've got to have the skill not only to be able to run, but also to be able to overcome that hurdle and know that you're going to have multiple. So, you know, what you and I do is we help people handle multiple objections in mm-hmm. what some people would, would look at as a flow chart in terms of conversations so that you can know, okay, if I know that if it's, if it's based on price, they're not going to necessarily tell me that it's just the price. They could tell me they need to think about it. And mm-hmm. that, well, you know, the truth is they might find it expensive. And then the reality deep down is that, well, they don't have the affordability or cash flow. So suddenly I've, I've just given you three examples of objections. And then they might say, well, you know, ultimately I need to, you know, speak to my spouse about it, which of course is a smoke screen. So if you don't have the wherewithal to know that these are coming down the pipe and how to respond to them you're done so a lot of people stop at one objection and they think that's all i need to know and it's like oh my god (laughs) i I gotta say i I love the hurdle uh analogy there just because if you think about it not knowing how to handle an objections which is what we teach in the sos dojo is like approaching the hurdle for the first time ever like you're yep. a newbie you're, you're like a bambi sprinter like you have no idea how to run how to hurdle and you just like clobber that hurdle and fall over yep. <laughs> versus being a well-trained athlete and you guys if you've ever like just look this up if you haven't seen it like look up on youtube warm-ups for hurdle races like it's pretty cool what these guys do when they're just like moving their legs how they move their hips over those hurdles Now imagine being a skilled athlete at that point. That's really what we do when we role play and we get the repetition in the dojo is we, we move towards perfection where you're just confident, you're comfortable. You can approach objections with conviction, which makes a huge, huge difference. And we're going to hit that with our key points here in a bit. So I want to ask you this, Joe, story time, because this is how we go. Start episodes. Story time. (laughs) Name, name a time or speak about a time here that you've handled and I just picked an arbitrary number because it sounds scary to most people. You've handled at least five objections. So stacked up, smoke screen after smoke screen. You worked your way through around five objections. And if you've done more, what's your record? So it's a two-part uh, my, question. That's a great question. So my my record is actually seven. Mm. Um, there's There's a guy who's in the dojo. His name is Connor Eagleson. He's a black belt. Mm-hmm. And uh, for those of you that are interested to find out more about the Black Belt program, you can reach out to Jeff or to myself regarding mm-hmm. what, how do you become a Black Belt in handling objections. Connor ha- holds the record, unless you've, you've done more, Jeff. Connor holds the record at 13 objections Ooh, to get to No the way course. I'm there. No. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I mean, I, again, my record is seven. And so yeah. the, and the, and the record of seven for me were people that were resistant to the idea of having a software as a service helping mm-hmm. out their retail business. Uh, so as you may know that I, I, I'm part owner in a business that's called Lead Cycles, and mm-hmm. there, there, are, there are some bicycle retailers that you know wanted to know more about the product. They wanted to know more about the service. They wanted to know if there was a deal for paid in full. They wanted mm-hmm. to know what kind of guarantees they had. Well, then, then, then they were comparing the service to, to another. And then it was a question of, you know, so it's one thing after another. And mm-hmm. so, of course, because the first time that I actually took the time to, we'll call it, sell that particular service, was it smooth and easy when I first encountered the objections? No. Yeah. Over time, when you encounter an objection, everybody, you need to be able to take the time and go, hey, listen, am I going to encounter this again? If so, what is the disguise that that objection could look like mm-hmm. or sound like? Are you doing your calls on the phone or are you doing them over Zoom or are you doing them are you presenting live and in person? This all plays a role in terms of how you're going to be able to handle those objections. So in my case, I was on a Zoom call. And mm-hmm. you know, previous my previous number live and in person was five. Then I jumped it up to six. Then I jumped it up to now seven. And so in, in context, it was a retailer. This was just a few months ago. And it was, well, hey, listen, I got to tell you, this, this is really expensive. That was the first one. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, look, I appreciate you letting me know how you feel. I'm just curious, what exactly are we comparing this to? And they compared it to a completely different, granted, it was a software that had, honest to God, 5% of what we had to offer. I could literally <laughs> pick that thing apart. And yeah. so instead of going, here's my spreadsheet of everything we do versus everything that they do, 
I simply pulled out one of one of the differentiating values and I said, so how important is it for you to be able to make sure that you not only have the ability to text, you could actually measure the amount of people coming back and buying from you. How important is that for you? I said it was very important. I was like, okay, so the fact that we have that feature included in our service and nobody else does, doesn't it make sense for you to move forward with us? Right? And then yeah. it was like, well, then it was, well, you know what? What kind of, it, I heard, what kind of deal can you give me? And yeah. I said, I can appreciate you're looking for a good deal. What exactly did you have in mind? And then they, they, I let, I found out what their expectation was. We already have a paid in full you know, price. So if you paid in full instead for the year, instead of doing a monthly, we're going to provide you a bonus. So we don't do a discount. We provide an added bonus feature. So mm-hmm. then the, then the, the prospect said, well, that's, that sounds great. Okay. Let me, let me think about it. Well, hey, I totally appreciate you want to take time to reflect. What is it that you want to think about that you and I didn't get a chance to talk about today? Silence. And then it was like, well, I just want to make sure that this is going to work for me. And I said, you know what? I really appreciate that you're letting me know the situation. Did you know that within your ecosystem, there's over 50 bike shops that, with your brand that are using this system as well? In fact, you're reminding me of this. Let me show you. And then what do I do? I put up a video testimonial and then I show them and then I come back and I go, so what do you think? Do you want to have the same type of results as this guy who's got four locations? (laughs) See where I went with this? I I already had the flow because I knew that these objections were coming. Yeah. How about yourself, Jeff? What what are examples for you that, that you've encountered, let's say, five objections or more? Yeah, so here, here's what I love about doing this show is that what Joe just gave you is like a recent example of an eloquent approach to a flowchart version of objection handling, right? Mine was not that clean. Mine was early on in sales, and it was a, a messy disaster where I was <laughs> basically just handling objections on the fly based on what I thought would work, like mm. not like no education whatsoever. Uh, so it was early on into selling personal training, and um, I had uh a a client at one of the gyms or a prospect at one of the gyms a guest that's what we call them a guest love it man (laughs) a guest at one of the gyms i was working at and it was actually i I believe it was an appointment for one of my trainers and we did what we call a to a turnover a a trade-off like whatever you want to call it right yeah yeah joe's familiar with this basically it's like if they feel they're not getting anywhere, there's a bad vibe, there's not a good connection uh, with this prospect, with this guest, then they know for a fact they're not going to be able to help this person. So they're wasting their time and the prospect's time. So instead, we turn it over to someone else. So this person had already gone through two or three objections. So then I come to the table, right? And it's always kind of awkward at first with the TO. So I I head on over. I'm like, hey, how's it going? Introduce myself. I'm like, you know, hey, you know, I understand you've been working with Josh here and like um, happy to help you out. What's on your mind? And just kind of like introduce myself and ease into the conversation and say, well, you know, like, yeah, I mean, I'd love to work with you guys. It's just too expensive. And I didn't know how to handle it as eloquently Mm. as uh, Joe had done. So I definitely didn't have I don't even know what I said, honestly, like at this point, I have no idea. We all um, start that way, Jeff. Like I didn't, right. you know. Yeah, I, I, I was just pulling stuff out of my butt. I, I was like, "Let's go." Yeah. yeah, I was like, "Let's just let's figure this out. Let's pull it up by the bootstrap." So she's like three objections in, and then I'm like, "Let's do it. Let's keep going, right?" And yeah, I just I don't know, man. I worked through it. It was at least five. Um, I, I wish I could have documented something like that a bit more. Been recording myself at that time. I'm happy now, like working through the dojo. Uh, having more ways of, of approaching this and being confident in like what I'm going to say, like just mm. having objection handling scripts in the back of my pocket that I've practiced enough to authenticate them. So, I mean, I, I can hold myself now with conviction. It was like just early on, I, I, I would I would ask things like this, like what's what's really holding you back? Like I, I try to create shortcuts yeah. to handle objections, which I mean, if you guys can't really pick this apart, like it's being a little bit overbearing on people if you try to take those shortcuts because you're not really letting them feel acknowledged or heard. Uh, yeah. you're, you're just like, look, what's really holding you back? That's like going to your spouse, significant other and saying like, look, what's wrong? Why are you mad at me? 
Yeah, or even worse, it's using the why question. Why are you talking like this? Yeah. <laughs> what, what did I, Let's what did have I a fight. do? Right? Exactly. Like, if you yeah. want to fight, go do that with your significant other, okay? I, I promise you it's yeah. going to go terrible. So I would do stuff like that. And then basically the reason I had to handle multiple objections at that point was because I had to backpedal a bit to, like, catch myself up. And, I mean, somehow through some, you know, luck and, and charisma, I was still able to like hit record sales. So like, I don't, I literally just did this thing with duct tape and, and gum and a toothpick. I don't know. Like, I don't know how we pulled it off, but yeah, I, I do have several scenarios that come to mind where just selling personal training in general, mostly because it was like one and two year contracts that people would be like, I'm getting, you know, it's like getting into a, a cable company or, or signing up with Verizon, like for a new phone, you're like, man, two years or 30, 30 months of payments on my cell phone for, you know, I'm paying 200 bucks a month for my family's phone bill. Like, I don't, I don't know. You know, it was kind of like that. So you'd get a lot of him and and hawing and you'd have to, you know, just kind of work through that. I'd be like, it's going to be okay. Put first month down. And then it's just month to month payments after that. What happens if I go on vacation? So I would get like objections like that mostly. Like if you go on vacation, we put it on hold, you come back next month, we just push your entire contract a month. And, you know, you're basically just answering questions like that at that point. So I like your example for the eloquency that you're able to approach it with, which gives you a good idea, you guys, if you're wondering, like, what, you know, what are your guys' programs all about? I mean, that's exactly it. It's like if you want to, you know, borderline drown or like tread water while holding up, you know, 100 pounds and weight vest, like you can do what I did and just try to bootstrap it and figure it out or you can get professional guidance and role play the systems that work and have been proven to work and it's going to go much more cleanly like joe did because joe i'm sure you weren't like breaking out into cold sweats while you were going through seven objections with it, that guy it, right you know what's yeah that, well not at this stage because this was just a few months ago i can tell right. you early on in my career and it's interesting because I have this question get asked to me, and it's easy enough for me to say this, however, I'm going to say it nonetheless. And mm -hmm. I got asked this recently, if you could go back to your younger self mm -hmm. and you could give, like if, if Joe at, at almost 51, give the young Joe, you know, store owner, fitness equipment store owner at 20 advice, what would it be? And the answer would be get a freaking coach. Yeah. My God, my my ego Same. was just way too big at 20 years old thinking, man, I'm, I'm a, I'm, you know, because we were by 21, we had a seven figure business like at 21 yeah. years of age. So I just, you know, the truth is I didn't think my shit stank. And the problem <laughs> was if I was had I been measuring my metrics, I would have realized, uh, yeah, you know what? I'm coming in a little, little short here. Yeah. Now, of course, I measure my metrics and there's always and it's not a question of. Practice makes perfect. I love the way Les Brown puts says it. When you think of practice makes perfect, take that out of your head. That is gone. Mm -hmm. Practice makes improvement. No mm -hmm. such thing as perfection. There's none. Okay? So when we get to that place of I know that I need to consistently improve my game, this is what what's Kaizen? What is the Japanese word for Kaizen? Why is it in the dojo? Well, guess what? It's continual, never-ending improvement. It doesn't mean join Kaizen get perfection. That's not how, what it means. Right. And it's no different than when you and I, when, when we're helping somebody become a black belt, mm -hmm. right? You can pay to become a, to, to enter the black belt program. And if you qualify, cause it's not just the money that gets you qualified and mm -hmm. we don't guarantee that you're going to get your black belt. We're not going to give it to you. Yep. You have to earn it. And so it's the same thing in your business. Had I known at 20, 21 as a, as business and 22 23 24 25 uh what i know now and this is what's great about good coaching right if you get good coaching in advance you time collapse so imagine mm -hmm. if you're yeah you know what if i could if i could time collapse within a 14 week or a 30 week or even and you and i both know people that have been in the dojo for you know for over a year they stay in it why because their sales keep growing you know, they take your program because they gain more access to time collapse. They get experience from somebody who's not only got his experience, but they also get experience from the fact that you've learned from other masters. Yeah. I mean, so the, 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 the craziest thing is to think that you know it all because the <laughs> earth yeah. will not be 
it will not be inherited by the learned. The earth will be inherited by the learners, people that consistently want to continue to grow. And so, you know, what I've what I'm learning is I don't know it all. Mm-hmm. I don't. That's it. I'm not suggesting that I'm not a good coach. I've been blessed with that. However, uh, I'm still learning as well, and I'm going to continue to give continue to give back. That's why we're here. And so, come back to the to the idea of of what this particular theme of today's episode is about is understanding that this is a marathon. The Kaizen mm-hmm. approach of continual, never-ending improvement will apply to itself so that when you're running this marathon that has hurdles along the way, if you want to be able to hop over those hurdles, you have to be able to put in the, the time. You've got to put in the reps or you've got to put in the miles. The question here is, do you want to run a full marathon? Because wouldn't it be great to be able to finish the marathon in a, what what would, instead of 26.2 miles, you could somehow you know, teleport and do it in 12 miles or in six miles and still get the same result because that's what Mm -hmm. coaching does. And so whether you decide to enter the dojo or you decide to get burly sales or you decide to go somewhere else outside of what Jeff and I do to help you guys, it's, it's, it's a smart move. Like we want you guys to keep learning. So, and, and reading a book, yeah, it's good. Seeing a video, yeah, it's good. Having people keep you accountable with live course corrections. I mean, I don't know of a better way. There's no comparison. There really isn't. And, and like, I, I've learned all of those ways. I've done the modules. I've done the courses. When I initially got started, I was just reading books like The Sales Bible by Jeffrey Gittimer or yep. The Psychology of Selling by Brian Tracy and many more. And those were a good start, but not having those those live cues, the course corrections, uh, someone just to like individualize the approach for me because like Jeffrey Gittimer didn't sell personal training. Neither no. did Brian Tracy, I can promise you that. Uh, yeah. These guys were selling completely different stuff in totally different industries. They were applying universal principles to sales, which was definitely helpful. But it, it's kind of like, you know, step one, you get a framework, you get a baseline, you get a foundational knowledge for selling. And then step two, you start like applying that to what it is that you do. So you still have to customize it. You have to make it fit what you're selling. And then you have to practice it because, you know, that step three, that skill practice, selling is a skill like anything else. If you don't continuously practice a skill, what happens? You get rusty. Yeah. Exactly. You have to constantly sharpen the axe. That's yep. how you keep moving forward. That's how you're more successful. That's how you help more people. And that's obviously how you sell more. So, you know, role play is a key part of both of our programs. And in the SOS Dojo, for example, we get like six to eight people in a group role playing for an entire hour and they get constant reps. It's not like one person role plays for the whole hour. It's just like boom, 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 boom. It moves fast. The energy stays high and it's a lot of fun. But Ultimately, it's helping them all sharpen their acts. So one of the action steps for today, you guys, was actually role play. Um, you know, choose any uh, living, breathing organism that can respond back to you. So not a dog, not a mirror, like a person who can yes. interact with you and make it challenging. Don't make it impossible. It's easy to goof off while you're role playing. But imagine if you had a partner who could intelligently respond to what you're saying and provide you with several objections. Have a, they'll have a plan. Like, who cares? They have a plan. They're like, I'm going to say it's too expensive. And I'm going to say, well, I'm really just looking at my finances. Then they're going to go like a step deeper, blah, 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 right? And they're going to provide you with those objections, and then you get to practice working through them. And what that'll do is, again, it, it helps you develop that conviction, that confidence when you hear an objection. Here's the big thing. Imagine hearing it's too expensive a thousand times. The 1,001st time you hear it's too expensive in a real live situation, real live sales appointment, it's not going to feel that bad. You're not going to, it's not going to phase you. You're going to be like, too expensive? Heard this a thousand times before. I knew exactly what to say. And that's just it. You've got the sharpened axe. So role play is crucial, absolutely crucial. 
Um, and, and like I said, it's just something that you got to do. So get out there, find a partner, you know, again, significant others, fine coworkers are great. Like somebody else in the specific space you're in even better. Somebody who knows what they're talking about best of all, right? Yep. Somebody like, you know, having Joe or one of our, our black belts, uh, that run our dojos fantastic because they can provide appropriate course corrections and help you improve on the spot. All right. So. Some key points from today. First one we already hit, the sale begins at the first objection. Like that's the selling process. That's selling. Like it, 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 it's not, I mean, even if you're running a retail store, people come in, they're kind of looking at the pricing. They're like, ah, I'll wait till it goes on sale, right? <laughs> people don't just roll up and go like, sure, here's, take my money, right? Um, I mean, maybe once in a blue moon, but it's not something that you can rely on. Like stop lying to yourself if you think that that's just going to happen. And I experience this all the time with gym owners, Joe. I don't know if you do uh, with all the salespeople that you work with. But when I'm talking to a gym owner, what I more often hear than not is like, my closing percentage is great. Anybody I talk to that shows up at my gym, they just want the group training. So I just let them do that. I'm like, okay, so you're right. not actually selling it. not selling anything. No, you're, they're showing yeah. up. They're saying, I want group. And you say, okay. You're, you're, you're literally just a bouncer at the door. You're like, you got cover 20 bucks and they say yes. And then you let them in. Like, that's what you're doing. Yeah. That's, that's not sales. Exactly. How, uh, yeah. You're not, you're not assessing their challenges and you're not what helping them need? find, right. You're not finding what their needs are. So if you're just, you know, taking an order, that's like selling bread at the grocery store. Yeah. The, the bread's up on the shelf. They're walking <laughs> it through and they're, they're checking out this. That's not sales. Okay. Yeah. What Jeff is talking about if you're in the gym business or in the fitness business is you want to be able to give somebody a complete holistic package on wellness mm -hmm. that is not just based on the fact that they've got 30 bucks a month to spend mm -hmm. forget about what they have to spend figure out what it is that they they want to achieve and it doesn't matter what it is in terms of product or sales but if we're going to be talking about it, it, it talking about specifics here in, in the gym industry I mean, it's a rampant problem, and and you and I have both worked with people with in health, fitness, exercise equipment, and, and in yep. the gym industry. So, so yeah, like Jeff had said, step one today is understand that hey, the the sale begins when the first objection hits. Step two is understanding that this is a marathon, and there's gonna there's likely going to be more than one objection, and preparation and Preparation, understanding what's the flow going to be. The more you know of what these repetitive conversations are, the better it's going to be for you to be prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can get to a level of predictability with objections, you guys. No, if you, no if you handle, If you handle enough, you're kind of like, okay, I'm pretty sure I know what they're going to say next. And then when they say it, you're like, yeah, I thought so. And then you can just roll on through. So yeah, th th that's just crucial information. And the reason this this came up, other than the fact that Joe mentioned it on the last episode, was uh, I've had a few recent experiences, again, coaching gym owners, where, you know, they've said, like, I, I go through the sales process, and I struggle. And I'm like, Okay, like, what are some objections that you you come across that you struggle with? And they say, you know, they'll say, I can't afford it. And I say, what do you say? I say, Okay, wait, you oh my say, god you just say okay <laughs> they're like yeah they can't afford it i'm like oh interesting well that's why you're not selling so yeah. <laughs> like that's exactly it and, and joe mentioned this um early on and we've said it probably next to every episode just about smoke screens um in other words it it's a it's a false objection it's it's a red herring it's however you want to think about it it is not true and i mean 99% of the time, not true. When someone says, I can't afford it and it's not in my budget, I need to check with my spouse. And I'll just give you an example here. And we've probably mentioned examples before, but a budget. What is a budget but a fictional bubble that you place around your bank account? And you say, yeah. cannot expand beyond this limit or it will pop the bubble, right? But then you go to the store and you walk up to the checkout line. And what's at the checkout line, Joe? <laughs> oh, a whole bunch of impulse buys. All the impulse buys. And what do you do? Tell me, tell me that you haven't picked up an impulse buy before. Tell oh me God. you yeah, haven't been going them. through the store. You got your list and you're like milk, you know, like case of water, you got bread, whatever. And then you're like, oh yeah, I could use a bag of chips. Oh yeah. Yep. Case of beer. Sounds good. It's, it's going to yep. be a fun weekend. Like wasn't on your list. Tell me you have a budget. It's not real. That's not real. So that, and 
the fact that most likely, because I know none of y'all listen, listening to this episode right now would have a misleading sales process. And if you do, you should reconsider it. But if you have a misleading sales process, maybe they don't understand this as a sales appointment. But I would I would say it's safe to assume, Joe, wouldn't you agree that most of our listeners, if not all of them have a clear sales process, whereas I show up on a zoom call phone call or in person, I know that this is a sales situation, me as the consumer. I know you're going to sell me something today. In fact, I came here intending to find out if I was right about how I thought about you. If I if I'm thinking like, yeah, this I'm at a tipping point, right? I think this could be a good fit and I want you to confirm that for me and then I'll buy. Like that's it. Show me a good value proposition and if I like you, I'm probably going to buy. And it's really our opportunity just to mess that up. So, budgets aren't real. Talking to my spouse isn't real. <laughs> like I've already talked to her. Uh, if I showed up at an appointment, if I showed up at a sales appointment, I would have talked to my wife. Just the likelihood of people, and, and again, we could really deep dive just in the oh, yeah. spousal objection alone. We could deep dive on on the we, podcast we will on for, a future for several for several episodes. I mean, there is a psychological mm-hmm. aspect that people, and I have personally, for fun, I will share this. I have mm-hmm. personally. And I'll share this, the whole story another time. I personally said to somebody who is who is looking to do some work on the on on my vehicle. I said, "Yeah, I'll have to speak to my wife just to see how he was going to react." And he, mm-hmm. holy shit, the bed. He He's like, okay, cool. He, he was brutal, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And never mind the fact that he was saying, "Yeah, we got it." We this was when he was, he said, "Yeah, but." You need you need to you need to we need to do some work on your differential and I was like well it's a front wheel drive so I don't have a differential but that's okay and then I just said I didn't say that to the guy I just said well you know what I'm gonna before you do anything I'll have to speak to my wife first he said yeah okay and he left it so first of all I was like okay dude you're you're a complete shyster yeah because you're lying to me because I don't have a diff and I know the difference of of, of that first of all second he, of he all, wanted to install one Joe yeah yeah. <laughs> But it just gives it, it goes to show you that at that point, you know, it, it having the wherewithal f- for me uh, and and for for those of you that are listening, you know, we're we're skilled enough to know it's fun to be p- able to play both sides of the fence. Because I can tell you, I will sometimes throw objections out to people just to hear how they're going to react, and it's mm-hmm. it saddens me that like the majority of people have a really hard time communicating. So when an objection comes out, again, remember what we said at the beginning of this episode, people are afraid to make the wrong decision. What can we do to uncover what the underlying actual issue is? And how do we encounter or how do we face that fear with our guests so that we can help them decide? Because you know what? Doesn't it feel good when you've made a decision to move forward with something? Like, oh my God, that stress is off my shoulders or that that tight feeling in my gut is gone. Now I can just move forward, especially if you've done a great job of congratulating somebody, even if they haven't paid you yet. You've congratulated them on making the right decision. Feels mm-hmm. good. Yeah. Feels really good. 100%. And actually, uh, you just reminded me of something you said at the beginning of the show, which was people are afraid to make the wrong decision, but they're also afraid to make the right decision. And I could feel the listeners scratching their heads going like, wait, how can you be afraid to make the right decision? And I'll give you an example. Uh, in any coaching industry, it means that next up, you got to do the work. Like If you sign up, if you buy the thing, if it's gonna work, you're going to yourself do the work. And sometimes we're afraid to do the work. We're just not ready. Like personal training, people would be afraid to like, man, I got to now I got to show up three times a week, work my butt off, sweat. Oh, it's gonna be hard on some mornings. If it's cold, like there's ice on my car, I have to scrape it off. I don't want to do that. So, you know, people struggle through making that decision in, uh, you know, just life coaching where like you have to work on yourself. You know, you have to have some hard conversations you have to yeah, do some with, tough either things. with a coach or with yourself and you're gonna have yeah. to dig deep emotionally people don't want to do that kind of work unfortunately yeah. and yet when you we know that when you do these kind of, of of the actual work that we're speaking of whether it's emotional whether it's physical whether it's mm-hmm. leading into tough conversations with others when you do those kinds of that kind of work you the, the you're you just feel better yeah. And so, again, people are afraid to do that work, and they're also afraid to spend the money. Or the, the, the thought of, 
perhaps my significant other might have a problem of me spending my money as opposed to our money, which I think a lot of people realistically, they have their money and then there's the household money. There's two different things there. So we can have discussions on that. Like, Oh, we're, we're going to get to it in future episodes. Don't you guys worry. Now, For I want to sure, close the show yeah. out. We're going to close this episode out with three quick key points. And I'll say my piece. You say your piece. We'll kind of roll oh, through right. it. A little lightning round here. Uh, so number one, this is like a big pet peeve of mine. Trying to handle the objection, or you should try to handle the objection, before dropping down. So some of you guys have multiple uh, pricing options, some lower than others. Hopefully, if you're doing this right, you start with the highest price first. You can't go no, the other course. way. That's so a whole top, <laughs> Yeah, top down sell. So you start with your highest price item. Now the person objects. That's too expensive. Don't be this guy. Oh, no worries. We actually have this other package that's less expensive. Or immediately, that's okay. We'll split it into four payments. Like, just try to handle the objection first. Mm-hmm. Just try to sell the thing you're trying to sell. And that's that's just a pet peeve of mine. Again, I've seen it all the time with gym owners. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I've, yeah, right away. I mean, the, the the if if somebody is in a position where they're looking at your best option, right, the mm-hmm. best option first, and they they provide any kind of resistance on price, <clears throat> and one of the ways that it, if they provide any resistance on price, well, hey, that's that's fair. Everybody's going to provide you resistance on price. Yeah. Just know that going in. The richest people they? on the planet, right? The reason that yeah. the richest people on the planet are rich is because they know how to negotiate. So they're going to try to negotiate either a better deal. And mm-hmm. let me tell you, if you go in knowing that this objection is is going to come up, you'll be able to come up with a solution, which is, hey, how can I make this affordable for you? If yeah. Let's confirm whether or not this is the best solution for them. And that they love the idea of that solution. If that's the case, then all we got to do is iron out how we make this affordable for them. Mm -hmm. Or we iron out the fact that they see the value and they're just going to go for it. Because I can tell you, how many times, Jeff, have you ever encountered this where you show somebody the best option, they give you resistance, and then you you show them that there's incredible value to it. And then they turn around and they pay it in full. Oh, a hundred times. At least. Like, countless times. That's my point. You guys are leaving money on the table if you're just dropping down. And the other thing that Joe just said is if you do not confirm that they are in, that they 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 see the value, that they actually even want to do this, and you drop down, you're not going to make the sale because you're going to end up bottoming out to your your bottom offer. And you're right. doing a, a price sale. You're selling on price. You're It's a race to the bottom. And you're right? not helping your client. You're no. not helping them at all. Not at all. So pet peeve addressed next next key point uh sometimes you can just pause and the client will buy which actually joe just kind of addressed like like you can uh attempt to handle that objection they'll turn around maybe they buy that top item but i also want to say sometimes an objection what you perceive as an objection is not actually an objection correct and this ties into the last key point these go hand in hand and then we can talk about it real quick but don't rush into handling an objection you need to maintain conviction. Sometimes that means you need to take a breath. You need to pause for a second. You can't just be like, uh, if Joe, Joe, throw me an objection real quick. Hey, you know what? I, I'm going to have to go home and think about it. Well, what are you thinking about, Joe? Right. <laughs> like if I just, if I jump yeah. down Joe's throat, I'm like, Joe, what do you mean you got to think about it? Like you're attacking this person. So don't be that guy. Instead, take a breath, right? Hey, Joe. I appreciate that you want to take the time to process this decision. Now, if you don't mind me asking, Joe, what exactly is it that we didn't cover today that you're going to go home and think about? You have just provided huge value right there, Jeff. First of all, you took the time to acknowledge me as the prospect, as the guest. Mm -hmm. You took the time to pause before you even acknowledged. Then you took the time to pause between your acknowledgement and you asked a question and the, to- the tone of voice that you used during your ask was very, um, cur- it was curiosity based. It wasn't, mm-hmm. hey, I'm going to put you through the Spanish Inquisition here. Like mm-hmm. there's a, it, it, replay that part, guys. What Jeff just gave you is absolute gold. And it wasn't so much the words he used, it was how he used them. That 
in and of itself. 38% of the way that we communicate is tone of voice. 55% is body language. So the words that Jeff used, that's yeah, 7%. I'm not suggesting that they're not important. It's mm -hmm. all important. However, pause. The pause is so much more important than people realize. And one of the things that one of my mentors, and in fact, even in the recovery movement, they say this, and it's pause and agitated. And you can do that, take that to the bank, whether it yeah. is in sales yeah. or with life, people that you love, your friends yeah. and family, pause when agitated. What a difference that when you can pause just a little bit when you're agitated, what does that do? I mean, it lets you process your thoughts, right? It lets you calm yeah. down. Uh, Joe and I talked about this on the, the dojo yesterday uh, that, that uh, Daniel was running and you were in was um, I mentioned when somebody like makes you mad, you get upset about something, oh. they say something rude, they attack you on the internet. I have a rule that I learned from a coach a long time ago that you just wait 24 hours before you respond to that. Now, well, I was really I, agitated. I can't wait 24 hours during objection handling, but I'm just saying life scenarios, if somebody's mean to you, like maybe consider waiting a while before you respond. That way this you is so off. important about the point of practice. Mm -hmm. The ability to pause when agitated so that you can build that emotional resilience. And this is why guys, you know, one of the action steps that Jeff and I are telling you to do today is go find a partner. Mm -hmm. Go find a group, actually. The best way to do this is in a group setting because now you're putting yourself under that additional pressure so that when you ha have this happen in real life, it's it, it becomes unconscious competence. And the only way to get to unconscious competence or to watch a hurdler run or anybody who's doing the steeplechase and they just do it unconsciously. They're just jumping over those hurdles and they're just gliding. Like they don't miss a yeah. step, they don't miss a beat. It's impressive. Well, guess how? they've done it because they put in the reps, yeah. right? It, they, they've been able, it's like Michael Phelps, who's gone into the pool millions of times, yeah. right? He does it without thinking. He just becomes unconscious. And of course he's breaking world records. Well, you could do the same thing in sales. Yeah, he's also a fish, but that's an, he another is. story. He is, he's got uh, gills. He's a fish man. <laughs> so let's, let's uh, we'll close this out with, with uh, one last thing. I did want to touch back on that. Like, what if it's not an actual objection? And maybe this teaser is could be a future episode. Um, an example would be, hmm, what do you what do you do when the prospect says, hmm, or oh, this she is, we, we, I, I don't know. Yeah, this is this is coming up even in future dojos, and, yeah. and it's called the the unspoken objection. Yeah, there are unspoken objections. In fact, you even made reference to it, where it's like, mm, I don't know, or yeah. and then the tone of voice of the I don't know. It could be, I don't know. Yeah, right? when you hear somebody go, I don't know, versus I don't know. Yeah, they, they both say they, they use the same words, but what they're saying are completely different. And then how do you handle that? That's a whole other episode. Yeah, definitely a whole other episode. Uh, the funny thing that I wanted to bring that up for is sometimes you can just wait and they go, okay, let's do it. They'll answer it themselves because you paused. I've, totally I've had true. that happen so many times where early on I jumped in, killed myself, like lost the sale. And then other times I learned, I just waited. I'd be like, yep. silence, just awkward silence. And they'd be like, all right, let's do it. And I'd be like, yes. It's so, do it's, it's so challenging for us because I'm cognizant of the fact that this is a podcast and I want to mm -hmm. be quiet to show the point. <laughs> However, let me dead, pause. <laughs> dead air on a podcast, people would just go, I guess it's over. And it's like, well, no, I'm pausing <laughs> right now, except it's not entertaining anymore. So I can't just shut the hell up. I got to keep yeah. talking. So yeah, you'll, you'll just you'll just have to cover it and be like Jeff is pausing right now for effect. <laughs> Chaz, Chaz would be in there. Yep, Jeff is pausing and Jeff uh, is pausing. So yeah, Chaz had a problem with this early on with one of our fishing podcasts, I think, and he he tried to collapse like uh, uh this weird pause that we had on one of the episodes, right, Chaz? I think I don't know. It was something like that. We we filled the silence with something because it was so awkward. Uh, but yeah, all right, you guys. That's it for this episode. Hopefully this was helpful for you. Again, ha handling objections is a marathon, not a sprint. Please do not give up right off the bat. Go to fight. Like, prepare for this. Practice this. 
learn and then practice that skill over and over again. If you want more help, of course, we're here for you. You can book a free call with either of us, Burley Sales, SOS Dojo. Go follow us on Instagram at Burley Sales at the S uh, is the SOS Dojo now. We changed a bunch of, a bunch of things for the Dojo. So what's the IG handle now, Joe? Well, for, for now, you can still go to SOSDojo.com. That's probably the best. Cool. D-O-J-O.com in, in the IG handle. Yeah, you and I still have to fix that. So we're we're working on things, you guys, behind yep. the scenes. Don't worry. <laughs> By the time it's theirs, maybe we'll have this figured out. I don't exactly. know. Exactly. So we'll, we'll get there. But hey, thank you guys so much for listening. Again, be sure to drop a five-star review if this was helpful for you and share an episode uh, with a friend. Anybody in sales, anybody owning a business, this should be helpful for them. And we'll catch you guys on the next episode.